From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. We're going to be talking about how do you get cars to have better fuel efficiency. Up to now, there's been a lot of focus on powertrain. Looks like the industry is starting to focus on making cars lighter. But how do you go about doing that? I've got three experts to help get us into that discussion. Randall Sheps is the marketing director of Alcoa. John Van Alstein is the CEO for an organization called iCar. We'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. And Ed Moss is the engineering group manager for body structures on the Chevrolet Corvette. And great having you all on Autoline this week. Yeah. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, Ed, do you see that right, that the low-hanging fruit was power-trained? Do I have this right? There's more emphasis on light weighting now? No doubt in the body structure. Obviously, coming from Corvette, it's kind of a different equation. It's light weighting for a little bit more speed. But I think a lot of focus from our products at General Motors have been on the powertrain, and now we're really getting after the body structure. And what can we take out of the body structure? How light can a car get? And I know the, the, the Corvette's sort of at the bleeding edge of all that. The interesting part is, as we try to get lighter, the standards get tougher and tougher. So it's like we're chasing our tail. I mean, we, we get lighter, we come up with better ideas, but the requirements for the car get harder and harder. Um, powertrains get more sophisticated, more NV requirements. The crash requirements get tougher every year. So, uh, but I think we've a lot of advancements in materials and processing for making those materials is getting the affordability down where you can put it on not just a Corvette, but other product lines. Uh, Randall, as we see this, this push to improve fuel economy, and as you know, from 2015 to 2020, the, the standards really ramp up. There's so much talk about aluminum. Uh, we've seen Audi going back almost 20 years ago with their A8 go very aluminum intensive. Jaguar and Land Rover have done the same. Now Ford going with the F-150. Uh, what's it like from Alcoa's standpoint? Are you getting uh, knocks on the door from all the different car companies now? Without question. And, you know, the, the really exciting thing about what's going on is that this, is this shift from these expensive luxury vehicles really to the mass market. Uh, this technology has really has matured to the point where uh, it's, it's, it's ready for prime time and ready, ready for the mass market. So. But John, and we, we got to get up more into this. ICAR, of course, is an organization that does training for collision automotive repair. Yes. And yes. this is going to be a huge factor in it, is it not? Yeah, it's a big consideration. Um, ICAR stands for Inter-Industry uh, Conference on Auto Collision Repair. And so we put together uh, training programs and knowledge products for the uh, aftermarket, if you will, the repair industry. And... Um, Certainly, the whole trend towards optimizing the complete vehicle and particularly light weighting as it relates to structures and the various different technologies that are going to show up on the vehicle is a challenge for the industry. And um, th the trick is not only making it manufacturable so it comes off the production line, but it's also designing the vehicle and putting in the, the proper uh, design for repair and the uh, uh, cascade of that information to the uh, repair industry. And so that's the role that we play, uh, working with the automotive industry, the insurers, and the repairers. Ed, Corvette, of course, has been had a lot of aluminum and other materials that we can get into as well. i got to believe this is a consideration. You know, how, how do you get these things fixed? I mean, when you set out to design them and introduce new materials, you got to be factoring that in. And, and I was talking to John before he came on set here, and, uh, you know, we have our service guy right there from the beginning because I'm an engineer trying to design a lightest weight car, but, and we may have to penalize a little bit to be more serviceable. As you know, on the Corvette, we broke the frame rail for mass reduction into five segments away from one, but it, it also helps serviceability. I mean, the ser serviceability guy was there cheering us on, because now we have a front clip, a rear clip, and we have a center portion for the suspension. So they're in there with us from the beginning. And, and as you get into aluminum, it's just a whole other area that we don't have the expertise in the past. So we rely on people like John to tell us what we can do and what we can't do in the field. I've never heard of a serviceability guy looking over the design engineer's shoulder as that engineer designs. Is that unique to Corvette or is that kind of? No, I, it, it's very common. And I joke that, you know, I was telling him ahead of him that I don't even know he's in the room sometimes. But if, if I misstep, he's there going, and you're not, we're not ready to do that yet. You know, we got to be able to service the car and it's got to be affordable. So, no, it's, it's common practice that the service engineers are right there from the beginning. And it's a very unique set. I mean, they, they really have an eye on how can we service this and make it affordable for the customer in the field. Yeah. Randall, do so you what, see, well, see that same thing? Well, I think, you know, one thing a lot of people don't, don't uh, uh, recognize or understand is that 35% of the car hoods are aluminum today. So you really got, 
there there is a lot of aluminum servicing going on today already in the in the industry but certainly with the launch of the f-150 uh that depth of knowledge there'll, there'll have to be a much greater depth of knowledge in the in the service bay and how, how to process aluminum you know in the case of uh corvette here um you know to what ed was just saying we were GM's partner to make sure that uh, welding training got out to the industry. So we got involved pretty early on with GM on the rollout of like the uh, C6, for example, and the ZR1 uh, aluminum to uh, be GM's partner to get that training out there. So, so there is a level of engagement um, up front. Not all OEMs react the same way there. Um, I would say Ford's a really good example, you know, with the... Well, you uh, just announced a program, didn't you, to, yeah. to partner with Ford on so, training for their people? So Ford was really proactive, you know, looking at the uh, F-150 and uh, put a lot of effort into repairability of that vehicle. And not just training, but also the tools and equipment required, and as well as the information required, the repair procedures uh, for those vehicles. In, in our case, we've been working with Ford for a couple years already. Uh, on the preparation for the launch of that vehicle. So uh, they were very proactive, and uh, we have a couple training programs that are very specific to how to repair that vehicle and how to deal with aluminum welding that uh, we'll be helping them get across the industry. But I think there's a misconception that, that, you know, that there's some, that aluminum is difficult to repair or difficult to work with, and I think that what the, the work that ICAR is doing, I think, will will convince the service industry. It's really, it's just a little different. It's it's not difficult. You need, you know, per, perhaps a little training, some special equipment, but it really is not a moon launch. There's one point on that. As you get into, we try to make the cars more and more efficient. We just don't do the mechanical attachments like the spot metal and the spot welding and MIG welding. We're now getting into the adhesives. And, and that becomes a whole other equation in the service and, and building the car, but really in the service industry and be able to weld around the adhesive. And so we have the adhesive and the mechanical, either the MIG or the spot weld, working in concert with each other. And that's, I see that as a whole other challenge for yeah. the service industry. The cars are just, they're getting tougher to repair across the board, whether they're aluminum cars or steel cars right. or what they're made of. We put the adhesive in steel also. Right. Right. But, you know, it's not just aluminum. There's a whole complexity of different materials that are coming right. together. You know, okay. not unlike you talked about, about the joining technologies, you know, um, there's been a lot of discussion about aluminum, but, you know, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about high strength steels. Right. And, you know, yeah. high strength steel is a different animal than the mild steel that the world's been used to for many, many years. And uh, so it's really, really critical that. Uh, you know, from my perspective, when the when the vehicle's getting repaired, that uh, the technician knows exactly what they're dealing with, that they have the up-to-date information, that that information's cascaded from the OEMs, and that the training is available to go along with that so they know how to do it. So. Ed, you mentioned structural adhesives, which are great when you're trying to put aluminum and plastic and right. steel and carbon fiber, all these things together. What's the long-term durability? I mean, th this is sort of new. It's not brand new, but it's being used far more extensively in the structure than ever before. Yeah, and certainly not being an adhesive expert, but I can say on Corvette, C5, C6, and C7, we have relied on adhesive from the beginning. The hard part, you're getting more and more advanced adhesives, crash toughened adhesives, um, it's just, it's becoming more of a primary load carrying member. You know, it, it's, the, the adhesive is great. If you, 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 you service it right, you engineer it correctly, um, it's, it's, it's here to stay. It's just, you're more efficient because you completely attach your metal together as opposed to like spot weld. So it's really augments and you have an opportunity to make the car more efficient. Certainly if you use the adhesive, but like I said, it, it just, it's more difficult to manage in the plant, in the service industry, et cetera. Yeah, I, GM, in my opinion, is probably the most aggressive at using structural adhesives. I was just stunned to learn very recently that Honda doesn't use it at all. So it, it's amazing to see, you know, right, the gap strategy. from, you know, GM, if I'm right. right, probably using it more than anybody else and Honda not even touching yeah, it. I, yeah, and I don't, you know, I can't tell you, I, I, I would know what they do, but I, when you are using adhesives, you have another layer, you have to work with surface treatments also. You have to understand what is the coating on your aluminum? There's various coatings we demand for certain characteristics of adhesive or for welding, oxidation with welding. I mean, mm -hmm. this, you know, and steel has, you know, PHS steel is a good example. You have the same problems with the con connectivity. And as we get more advanced materials, the connections have to be more advanced. Mm. And we actually, in Alcoa, we, we developed a, a surface treatment for aluminum that actually makes these adhesive bonds perform better. 
Uh, is it, that the, the 951, 951 that I've been reading it. about? That's right. Titanium, zirconium. <laughs> right, right. It makes, it makes them more durable. It makes adhesive bonds more durable. So it allows you know, the right. car companies to design with more confidence around adhesives, with adhesives. Mm. But it almost sounds like, uh, I, I mean, if I'm a car owner, I'm thinking, ay, 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 if I get in an accident, uh, this, it's going to cost me a fortune to get my car fixed. Is that the case, John? Well, um, you know, I, th I think the key thing is is the, the focus on, you know, design for repairability, design for affordability, quite frankly. You know, uh, a vehicle needs to be affordable to be repaired because otherwise that cascades to cost to insure, right? You know, so um, I think that uh, as an industry, we have the wherewithal to get that, you know, proper information and the proper approach to getting all that done. You know, it's just a matter of, of making that happen on the execution of the product development process and then the execution of the service strategy. And, uh, you know. So that's what, that's what we're focused on. That's what we do. But I think right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, the days of the simple repair, you know, on the, on the car body are just gone. It's, you know, the, these designs are getting optimized with yeah. multiple materials, you know, right. attached uh, together and very right. sophisticated joining methods. Yeah. It's just, uh, th things are just getting more complicated right. to repair. Tad always says there's mosaic of materials. I don't want to steal his line. And that's what it is. It's like the best material for the job and the best connectivity method for the job. Right. And, and for all the way through from manufacturing it in the plant, affordable, mm -hmm. and then servicing it. So. Yeah, so the trick from a service perspective is that, you know, vehicles were for a very long time mild steel, right? And when you look at a vehicle today, you can't really tell what's going on under the skins, right. okay? And um, so if the industry approaches that repair the way that they have for years, that's not a good approach, okay? The, each vehicle, you talk like Honda, for example, they don't embrace adhesives. There's a variety of different joining technologies. There's a complexity of metals that are in the vehicles today. It's not just aluminum, it's not just steel, there's magnesium, uh, there's carbon fiber being introduced, there's all sorts of stuff, right? And, you know, so the trick is that it's vehicle specific. You know, you need to know exactly what's in that vehicle uh, when it goes into the shop because if you put heat to the wrong spot, it could destroy the uh, integrity of the vehicle. And you may not even know it. And it would not be visible. That's right. And you wouldn't even know it. It could go back out down the street. So and you that's have not, to have that thing. training. But, right. So, you know, our whole, our whole deal is about complete and safe quality repairs for the ultimate benefit of the consumer. And that's why we're here. So. I think there have been some predictions, too, that you'll see the, the further consolidation in these body repair operations, right? Because as the sophistication, higher sophistication is required to do these repairs, you know, you'll have, you, you know, you'll have, uh, you'll have these, uh, these body shops sort of need yeah. to invest in this, in this uh, equipment to do the repairs. Well, it I won't think, be a shade tree kind of operation. Yeah, I think the investment needs to be there. You know, that doesn't necessarily require a large network of, of uh, you know, they call them MSOs in our industry, multi-shop operators. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it could be an independent shop, but, you know, they've made the commitment to the learning culture. They've made the commitment to the equipment. And, uh, you know, that's what it's going to take in the future. But I think Randall raises a really good point here. Dealers may not have as much of an advantage going forward. The advantage might go to the independent repair shops because uh, let's just talk carbon fiber structure. BMW's got that on their i3, which is out, and their i8, which is about to come out. Very low volume. You know, if I'm a, 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 a BMW dealer, I may not see many repairs. Why would I want to invest in all this training and tool wouldn't it be better if some of the independent shops that could handle multiple brands mm. be able to do these kinds of repairs? Isn't it better for your members that this happened this way? It's interesting. Yeah, mm. well, yeah, there's certainly a business strategy there. Um, and, um, yeah, and the investment's not, not small to, to make that happen. Um, yeah, that's definitely a situation. Questions to be oh. answered. <laughs> Fun Is fact. It? Oh, sorry, fun fact about the BMW i3, it actually has more aluminum in it than it does carbon fiber. So, just Because the, the, the frame, the really. Yeah, yeah, they really. have a lot of aluminum. And I have not looked at that car in depth. I think it's an interesting way they've approached it, but obviously they do have a lot of aluminum in that also. I think here's the trick. You know, the, um, we're working to inspire the industry to do the training and have the equipment and do all the right things, right? Uh, but we're not the only uh, source of inspiration for the industry. There's... there's Organizations like General Motors, for example, that inspires their repair network to have the proper training, to have the proper equipment. Very good. And 
you know, GM points to us to help them with their training, and that's a great thing. Other organizations like Honda, they have a repair network. It's called the Pro First Program that requires ICAR Gold Class, which is our consumer-recognized brand for... Well, explain that a little bit. What, what is Gold Class? With, without so, chapter and verse, just a thumbnail. So, so Gold Class is a consumer brand that can tell the, the customer that this shop has been trained to be able to perform complete and safe repairs, okay? And we have today about 3,000 gold class shops across the United States. Uh, we have another couple thousand that are on the road to gold. And uh, our objective is to have every shop be gold class, quite frankly. And so we work with folks like GM or Ford or Honda, in the case of Honda, to be in the Honda network, you have to be gold class, which is a great thing because that encourages the training that's necessary to do, deal with the vehicles that are coming out today. And, uh, but it's not only just OEMs, it's also insurers too. You know, uh, Allstate's been a big supporter of uh, Gold Class over the years and, and many others uh, as well. And uh, so, so we, you know, we reach out to the OEMs, we reach out to the insurers to help us get that, uh, that education knowledge out to the industry. And, and we're making it tougher. I mean, it, I mean, we're doing this because the customer demands lightweight, right? So we use aluminum, there's aluminum sheet, there's aluminum extrusions, you know, now you're getting high pressure die casting. You know, and, and high pressure die casting will take many parts and combine them into one large part, and then you start getting into you know, repairability. If you have one large part, it's a single casting, and the demands just keep going up, and it's all driven by you got to be lighter. And the Corvette uses carbon fiber and uh, what the hood, uh, the roof. Well, yeah. The, well, what, what we have about actually, structure? Well, actually, the entire underbody. Well, we have our aluminum frame, and that's like I said, a mixture of castings, extrusions, hydroforming. And then the way we've always built Corvette is we have our composite panels, which really form our underbody closeouts. And they're really a mixture. That used to be a specific gravity, which is the measure versus water, about 1.6 to 1.7. We're down to 1.2 now. It's called carbon nano composite, developed with our supplier. So we're really pushing the limit on that, where I, I joke that pretty soon our composite panels are going to float, because when you hit one, just below one, you're floating. But, and so as we, we're continuing to push the envelope on more advanced composite materials. Hmm. What, what do you, you said you haven't really studied the, the BMW i3, but could that be a, a step down the road someplace for yeah, Corvette? You know, like you always, depending on, you know, like a lot of that, whether you do directional carbon or you do isotropic, like um, where it's not directional, it's basically all properties in the same direction, it's chopped fiber, where um, some of our panels have to be a certain thickness just for other reasons, so it doesn't benefit you to go to the high cost carbon. So it's like I said before, it's not just mosaic of the different types of materials, within the class of materials like carbon or within aluminum, do you want to go the higher strength aluminum or do you want to do the lower strength aluminum just like you do with steel? Again, it's always a cost equation for most mass efficiency to meet your crash requirements, your durability, and your stiffness requirements. So even within every class of material, carbon, aluminum, steel, then within that class, we have to look and say, what's the best carbon? Chopped fiber, continuous? Because everything has a cost to it, and you're trying to balance that to get the most efficient structure to meet all your standards that you have to meet. Randall, so, speaking of costs, uh, my understanding is uh, uh, a roll of aluminum, uh -huh. you know, costs, a, a ton of aluminum, I should uh -huh. say, is about $1,000 more than hot rolled steel. Yeah, but I think you have, to, you have to look at it a little more holistically. I mean, aluminum, a pound of aluminum does cost more than a pound of steel, but, uh, but, but as Ed will attest, you, you, you spend a little more to put the aluminum in the car, you can save money in other places. You know, you could maybe downsize the powertrain. You can, you, you, you generate what are called secondary weight savings. And I think the car companies are really getting fantastically good at doing this holistic calculation, saying, yeah. okay, we'll spend a little more to make the body light, and I can, I'm going to save it in powertrain, I'll save it in chassis, I'll save right. it. Aluminum is one-third of mass. So you, you got to decide where you spend that, where do you spend, where do you buy the aluminum? As you said, it is more costly. But there are also some techniques in aluminum that you don't have in steel. So again, that's the balance of, oh yeah, this part really wants to be an extruded or it wants to, you know, you stamp steel, you stamp aluminum, but there's some other things you do with aluminum that afford you more mass reduction. Like what? Can you just, Well, like I, the extrusions, you know, extrusion, you can extrude parts relatively low cost tooling and you can vary the gauge around the perimeter of that extrusion. It's got to stay along the length, but you can have 10 different gauges. And then like the, you know, the, die, the castings, the Corvette, we talk a lot about those cast nodes, picks up all the suspensions, it's the foundation of our vehicle. And it's, it's a tube, but yet it picks up our suspension points, it picks up our control arm attachments, and they're all in one casting. So there's no additional brackets. So you try to do those studies, okay, do I, and it's less attachments. So again, it's that balance of, okay, less attachments, 
but it's a single part. It's going to cost more, but it took, you know, maybe took the place of five or six parts. So less attachments means less labor cost less labor in the cost. assembly plant, exactly. and you can offset it that exactly. way. Or at too. the subassembly level as it comes into the plant. Exactly. And, I, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the car makers get better with every generation. You get a little better at, at right. how to use aluminum in, a, in the most efficient way and bring the cost down a little bit. You know, current generation Corvette compared to prior right. generation. So there's a learning curve that where you know, the industry will get better and better. And Corvette's unique. I mean, when, you, when we talk aluminum, Corvette's more of a frame structure with our bond on composites. That's always been a successful equation for us. But m mainly what Audi has done, they have some high pressure die casting or what Land Rover does, they have, are almost exclusively stampings. They have some castings. But you get this mix, and it depends on what your market for your car is, what the volume of the car is, and then it just then it's the equation that I think fits best for the parameters that you have to go after. There was a, a great quote from uh, one of the engineers at Ford uh, talking about the F-150 saying, we didn't set out to build an aluminum truck. We set out to build the best truck we could for our customers. So, and, and, I, and I think that brings us back to how you started out the conversation. You know, it's not the pursuit of light weighting for the sake of light weighting, right? It's about optimizing the complete vehicle. And you know, so a lot goes into that. You know, before iCar was in the engineering world in the electric vehicle space, and it was about optimizing the vehicle. And it was a discussion we were having with the industry you know, 10 years ago. And uh, we're there today, it's great, you know? But um, you know, you don't, you're not just challenged with light weighting. You've right. got the powertrain matching you know, yeah. situation. You lightweight, you can downsize safety the engine. Safety. Then you have to worry about safety. You know? So I'm kind of curious. You know, so you've got, you know, you've got light weighting, but then you also have safety, right? right. And safety has to go up at the same time. You right. know, so it, that's got to be a challenge. That's what I was saying from the beginning. Safety standards, as they should, you get more stringent every year. And we discover more, and there's more tests. And, you know, it, it, society demands it, so you have to meet it. But they don't want a car that weighs 100 pounds more. They actually want a car a little bit faster, a little bit better fuel economy. And, sure. I mean, that's the challenge. That's why there's a lot of engineers in the, in the auto industry. <laughs> the engineering in, field's bright. Huh? The engineering field's bright. <laughs> And I think, John, you hit on a key point. It's, it's the optimization of the total package. Absolutely. Because what led BMW to going carbon fiber was they were looking at these really expensive batteries and thinking, right. how can we take some battery cost out of it? Well, right. geez, if we could use fewer batteries, we could take a ton of cost out. Oh, if we made it out of carbon fiber, we can take batteries out. So even though carbon fiber is expensive, it takes out battery right. packs right. that are Absolutely. even more expensive. Absolutely. Well, EVs. You know, electric vehicles are where that, that trade-off, the trade-off for weight, you get the biggest bang for the buck in taking weight out of an electric for exactly that reason. And I haven't, I don't, I haven't followed the BMW. It's not really our direct competitor right now. And, but if you go back up all the way to what they do in Washington State to make the carbon, you know, built that plant on, I think it's Columbia River. I, I literally Google it when I, when I heard it was coming, and it's fascinating. They broke ground, they built this plant. <laughs> yeah, it, was, very interesting. Uh, yeah. BMW did a global study and said, where are electrical costs the lowest in the world, and where are they the greenest? Because uh, making carbon fiber is very energy intensive. Right. And they, that's why they settled in Washington yeah. State. It's all hydropower. And yeah. That may not be carbon. Maybe the fish don't like the dams that are there to do it. So there's always an yeah, environmental I, I issue. Look but a lot, but yeah. it's, it's an interesting. Obviously, they looked at what they wanted to do for light weighting so much that they're going to build a plant on, you know, out west to build their carbon and ship it in spools over to Europe. Mm. That's why you've got aluminum smelters along the Columbia River as well for oh, exactly yeah. that same I reason. I did not know that. Yeah. Got to find that uh, low-cost electricity. My understanding too is that uh, you're getting bombarded by so many requests for aluminum. There's a three-year lag time to be able to put in more smelting capacity. Well, it, it isn't smelting. It's uh, there, there's no shortage of of raw aluminum. What, what we have to put in is the finishing and treatment that that is very specific to automotive. So it's the heat treatment that we have to do to the sheet. And then the surface treatment we have right. to put on it is 100% specific to automotive. And that's where we need the lead time to get that in place. I always, so, I always kid, and I'm not in the commercial, and it's like, what, which will come first, the plant to build the aluminum or the car that wants the aluminum? It's yeah, like, right. it's like this, going sure. back and forth. <laughs> it feeds you know, together. It feels to me like we're, you know, we're stepping forward with the auto industry and trying to stay as aligned as we can and make sure that capacity is there for when, when they need it. Well, you know, it... it I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. You know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, you know, in terms of the technology evolution that's coming to vehicles, um, uh, you, you see it on Corvette, you see it on F-150, you, you see it other places, BMW, for example. And uh, 
you know, from a repair perspective, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. Uh, you look at the cafe requirements over the next 10 years, and there's going to be a lot of innovation that uh, that the repair side of the business needs to understand. So, you know, so we're focused on getting that training out there, number one. Number two, uh, we're focused on getting the knowledge out there, so working with OEMs interactively, our technical teams and the OEMs um, service engineering teams to make sure repair procedures are out there that properly document how to repair the vehicles. And then number three is getting involved, um, you know, more up front to help influence uh, design for repair. And it's not just uh, design for repair, but it's also, you know, related to parts. You know, if you look at, uh, um, if you look at the cost to repair a vehicle, um, you know, parts need to be recyclable because as you look down the stream, you have to be able to, you know, not everybody's going to be able to afford to repair a vehicle and the insurance rates for vehicles get pretty expensive. So recycling is a big deal. So you almost have to be designing for recycling as well, right? How do you, yeah. how do you disassemble a vehicle so that it can actually be utilized uh, post, uh, you know, post, post recycling? Post, yeah. John, I think you've hit on a critical point. You know, uh, this light weighting is being primarily driven for the mass market to improve fuel economy. I know for Corvette it's about performance as well. And fuel economy, we're very good in but, fuel economy. But fuel economy too, and you are very good on that on Corvette. But as you know, everyone talks about a carbon footprint. We can't just look at how the vehicle operates. We've got to look at the energy that went into making these materials and to your point, how they're going to get recycled. And, and I think that's what makes you know, th this whole conversation come full cycle now. It's not just the vehicle, it's the it's whole life true. cycle of everything. But with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Very interesting discussion. Boy, I, I, I really like what I've heard here. And I want to thank all of you. Randall Sheps, uh, the marketing director of Alcoa, John Van Alstein from uh, iCar, and Ed Moss, the head of body, body structures for the Chevrolet Corvette. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, fascinating. Yeah, appreciate Very good. Time. Thank you.